Cool, let's begin. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Arjen. I run a company named Open Query based here in Brisbane, so welcome to my new, new hometown. I lived here for 11 years, but I'm originally from Amsterdam. Um, I started Open Query in 2007 after leaving a company you may have heard of called MySQL, uh, where, I lived f uh, where I kind of lived for six and a half years. Um, that company was venture capital funded. Um, I started there as employee number 25 in 2001. I left in 2007 as one of 450. You can do the math, it just about doubled every year. Um, and it did that in revenue as well, which was really, really interesting. I learned a lot about how not to run a company. Um, it did really well, but it caused an awful lot of damage in, in places that I care about. It also did a lot of good in places I care about, and good in places I really don't give a toss about. Um, and, and one of those things is, but we grow, we're growing revenue. Yeah, in some cases, I don't care about that. Um, I care about my colleagues, and if you're growing that quickly, lots of people get lots of stress, and that is not necessarily cool. It's also not necessary. It's not an imperative. And that's the kind of thing I'd like to talk to you about today. Um, first, I'd like to run a video here, and I hope that my trying to do it full screen didn't mess up the caching. Um, we're talking earlier about, um, I think Bob Waldy mentioned the um, wealth creation. And I thought, oh, I've got something to say about that, but I need to check because there's a video about it. Um, it's another one of those imperatives that I don't believe in. And I'll, I'll show you the video because this guy is fantastic. Um, and then I'll, I'll tell what I want to tell. Let's see if this actually works now. I probably stuffed it up. I think I did. Okay. That one's nearly loaded. I'll just have to reload this one. It's only four minutes, so it should be quick to load. So what this guy does, he visualizes and talks about statistics. He makes statistics interesting. This is not good. Come on. Might have to let that run and, and run it at the end. Um, to give you an idea of what he talks about, um, he's plotted essentially how, how countries since, I don't know, 200 years ago have evolved in terms of lifespan and wealth. And he talks about that in, in various respects and, and notices differences and, and how things go together at different times of um, in the development of the various countries. There we go. Visualization is right at the heart of my own work too. I teach global health. And I know having the data is not enough. I have to show it in ways people both enjoy and understand. Now, I'm going to try something I've never done before. Animating the data in real space. With a bit of technical assistance from the crew. So, here we go. First, an axis for health. Life expectancy. From 25 years to 75 years. And down here, an axis for wealth. Income per person. 400, 4,000, and 40,000 dollars. So, down here is poor and sick. And up here is rich and healthy. Now, I'm going to show you the world 200 years ago, in 1810. Here come all the countries. Europe brown, Asia red, Middle East green, Africa south of Sahara blue, and the Americas yellow. And the size of the country bubble show the size of the population. And in 1810, it was pretty crowded down there, wasn't it? All countries were sick and poor. Life expectancy were below 40 in all countries. And only the UK and the Netherlands were slightly better off, but not much. And now, why start the world? The Industrial Revolution makes countries in Europe and elsewhere move away from the rest. But the colonized countries in Asia and Africa, they are stuck down there. And eventually, the Western countries get healthier and healthier. And now, we slow down to show the impact of the First World War and the Spanish flu epidemic. What a catastrophe! 
And now I speed up through the 1920s and the 1930s. And in spite of the Great Depression, Western countries forge on towards greater wealth and health. Japan and some others try to follow, but most countries stay down here. Now, after the tragedies of the Second World War, we stop a bit to look at the world in 1948. 1948 was a great year. The war was over, Sweden topped the medal table at the Winter Olympics, and I was born. But the differences between the countries of the world was wider than ever. United States was in the front, Japan was catching up, Brazil was way behind, Iran was getting a little richer from oil, but still had short lives. And the Asian giants, China, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh and Indonesia, they were still poor and sick down here. But look what is about to happen. Here we go again. In my lifetime, former colonies gained independence and then finally they started to get healthier and healthier and healthier. And in the 1970s, then countries in Asia and Latin America started to catch up with the Western countries. They became the emerging economies. Some in Africa follows. Some Africans were stuck in civil war and others hit by HIV. And now we can see the world today in the most up-to-date statistics. Most people today live in the middle, but there are huge differences at the same time between the best of countries and the worst of countries. And there are also huge inequalities within countries. These bubbles show country averages, but I can split them. Take China, I can split it into provinces. There goes Shanghai. It has the same wealth and health as Italy today. And there is the poor inland province Guizhou, it is like Pakistan. And if I split it further, the rural parts are like Ghana in Africa. And yet, despite the enormous disparities today, we have seen 200 years of remarkable progress. That huge historical gap between the West and the rest is now closing. We have become an entirely new converging world. And I see a clear trend into the future with aid, trade, green technology and peace. It's fully possible that everyone can make it to the healthy, wealthy corner. Well, what you have seen in the last few minutes is a story of 200 countries shown over 200 years and beyond. It involved plotting of 120,000 numbers. Pretty neat, huh? That's cool, huh? Actually making numbers work for you. Um, so, what I noticed here, but what wasn't mentioned, I'll, I'll give an analogy on, on what, I, what I noticed. Um, we all have our electricity at home or office. And is it, is it all reasonably reliable for, you, for people here? Yeah, it works pretty well. But it sometimes blacks out, it sometimes browns out, right? Now. Is it reasonable to expect the energy providing company to make it even more reliable? You could ask, but they would probably tell you that it's ridiculously expensive because it's already reasonably reliable. To actually get a higher reliability becomes prohibitively expensive. It is a kind of a law of diminished return kind of thing. You get huge improvements when it's complete crap and you improve it, and then later on when it's reasonably reliable, it levels off. That's what I noticed, and, and actually, any idea here how you would solve that particular problem? How do you get your house supply of electricity or particular bits of equipment? And I've already given something away there. Um, how do you get that more reliable? UPS. A UPS. So you, you buy UPS, which is ridiculously cheap now. You can buy them at every computer store and they cost nothing anymore and they work reasonably well. And you tie it only to the bits of equipment that you need. So you pick from all the stuff that you have that each electricity, the bits that you actually really care about, and then you buy something locally rather than relying on some centralized solution to, to solve that thing. And that's similar to what I noticed in those stats. Um, I'm all for wealth creation, but beyond a certain level, it's really not relevant anymore. I don't think any of us in this room is in need of wealth creation. We have a reasonable living standard. We don't have to fuss about, about food and health. So. And we, have, we, can, we can afford being here for an entire week um, chatting away about things that interest us. Yes, it makes money, but it's also fun, right? If it wasn't fun, we wouldn't be here. We'd get on with our lives another way. So that stuff is not really necessary, I think. It's nice to make, to make some money, but 
it's not necessary from my perspective to make huge bundles of extra cash that doesn't actually, from my perspective, improve people's lives. It can, but it quite often does not. It creates stress and, and other things uh, for the people doing it in the surrounding environment. And that's, that's something I wanted to add to uh, Bob Waldy's mentioning of, um, of wealth creation. Now, let me find my preso again, because that one. By the way, this is not a Mac. You may have noticed it's running Ubuntu. It looks like a Mac, but it's not. Yes. My Mac is there still. <laughs> I will fess up to that. Um, I'll also explain why. It's one of those practicalities. No, that's not what I was looking for. I'm sorry about that. I actually managed to make it crash. It can still do that. Um, so this runs on the bare metal. It's running Ubuntu Maverick, so 10, 10, 10, and it works really well. But sometimes it stuffs up, and I think it might have something to do with the Wi-Fi drivers. Doesn't it all? Always. OK, let's try this one and see if OpenOffice wants to behave this afternoon. You never know. The um, reason, by the way, I went to Mac about six years ago, six, seven years ago, is that I was traveling a lot. See, it crashed. Um, is I was traveling a lot, doing lots of uh, training and, and conference talks, and I needed a, a laptop um, that could not only resume, uh, not only uh, suspend, but actually resume. That's the more interesting bit, of course. <laughs> they, they, always re uh, they always suspend, they can't resume. And um, the other thing was working Wi-Fi, and I just couldn't make that work at the time. That's why I went to Mac. So I've now been a happy prisoner for about five years and trying to get out of that. So now my spare laptop runs Linux, and I'm slowly getting there. Um, but there's still some things including some presentations that are in Keynote instead of something that I can actually read elsewhere. So it's work in progress. Um, let's make that work. Look at that. It actually does work today. There you go. So that's what we're talking about. Um, I've been doing a project called upstarter.biz, and it's essentially my company, Open Query, reverse engineered. So it describes what we do and how we do it. There's some pieces of paper. I'll actually send it around. You might grab a copy. I don't have a copy for everybody, but you can just grab something if you want and maybe share with your neighbor. And it's, it's available online as well, obviously, at that site address. Um, it kind of describes how my company operates and the rules it uses to operate. Because I, I tend to ask a lot of questions to myself as well as other people. Why are things the way they are? And I don't presume that something is the way it is because it's being done that way by lots and lots of companies. I really don't care about that. Um, there's probably a reason why things are the way they are. Um, and I, I had a brilliant example last, last week from an Upstart meeting. Um, I think it was about a turkey that got roasted. And grandma was always roasting a turkey, and she'd always chop off the, the two ends. And the whole family, therefore, would roast turkeys, chopping off the both ends. And someone at last bothered to ask why that was actually done. And it just had simply something to do with the size of the oven that it was already originally put in. There was no practical purpose to it. As far as the turkey was concerned, it had something to do with the situation at the time. It serves to ask those questions. And you can laugh about that one. But businesses do this, and they never think about it. My manager will say, that's the way it's done. Well, that's great. But may I ask why? And of course, then I'm this annoying, arrogant individual who shouldn't be asking those questions, um, but I do anyway. Um, and so that's, that's what this is about. And what I figured out doing the Upstart, I think, so sharing my experiences with other people and also learning a lot from what other people do. It's been really interesting over the last, say, year and a half, I think it's been going. Um, I figured out that most of it actually comes down to business processes. And so that's where, what we're discussing today. And Essentially, it defines who you are and what you can do, and that's what, we're, that's what we're about. So what I do, we do remote services for MySQL, and we don't do emergencies. I've already been declared nuts for that, so no need to do that. Um, my company's been going for nearly three and a half years now, and it's doing just fine, thank you. It's actually doing exceedingly well. It was set up before the GFC, and it actually grew during the GFC. We had very low overheads, which means we had no pain should something go wrong. That was just the way it was built. It, I didn't know the GFC was coming. No, it did necessarily. Um, interestingly, our business actually grew more than other businesses around us because my prices were reasonable. I wasn't trying to extract as much money as I could from my clients, as in how much can they afford, how much can I charge. My prices are low, 
it's a hundred something dollars a, an hour depending on how, how, um, how we do the work. And they're published on the website and they're not negotiable. Yeah, so I don't waste time on that kind of stuff. I could raise the prices, then negotiate for an hour, and you get something approximating that plus the, the wasted hour. But why bother? I just publish it, be done with it. That upsets people. They can't negotiate the price with me anymore. It's really sad. Um, but doing the no emergencies has given my company an edge. Wonder why? It has made my infrastructure cheaper. I don't need to have a whole call network to make sure my engineers are reachable and they are in different parts of the planet, so I wouldn't need that otherwise. Um, it means I don't care what happens in the evening and during weekends because I will not get phone calls with things that are extremely important. You see my daughter there, she just started year one, this is a couple of years old now, at South Bank, I think that was a mud puddle um, last week there, that's at, uh, at the Queensland Museum. Um, so she just started year one today, and I was actually able to, to be there at her school this morning uh, around 9 o'clock, which I would not be able to do if I had been in an office. Um, three days of the week I actually pick her up from her school at about, well, it was 2.30 last year in prep. Now this year it will be 3 o'clock, but I can just finish work and just finish early. I can do that kind of stuff because of the kind of business I run. I also have a better choice or broader choice of employees or contractors in my case, um, there are quite a few people, mostly with families, but also for other reasons, um, who don't want to do weekend and evening duty. And I think that's perfectly sensible. I can hire those people, my, let's call them competitors for convenience sake, I don't regard them as such, but anyway, they can't hire those people because they will not work for them. So I have a pool of talent that they can't touch. I think that's really cool. And it's, yeah, it, it creates wealth. It is a form of wealth for me, but it's mostly the freedom to actually do some extra things and actually live. So. I make a life, not just a living, and that's, that's kind of important to me. So these are the things that are being, being tossed around. I think they didn't make it much further than the front row, but oh, there's still some there, somewhere? Still some there? Okay, that's good. Um, I'll show you another one, uh, because it's rather relevant to what we're doing here. Let's see if we can make that work. I might have to exit that for a second. Um, actually, I'll run that one at the end. Um, about what mo motivates people, that might be the best way. Yeah. Yes? Uh, have you published this, uh, your principles hmm? on the website? Yes, yes, it's up there. Yeah, yeah, that there. Yeah. So you go to Upstart the Biz, you look up the, there's a click called principles and you'll, you'll see them there. Yep. So where do business processes come from? And as far as I can tell, it's essentially the same as a tradition. Something gets done, like the turkey, and at some point, someone else come in, comes into the kitchen, the business, like an administrative person, and they do whatever the other person did, because that's how you learn. Yeah? This is the way you process a new client, that's how you enter them into the system. And that becomes business process, because at some point, another person new, new comes in. You need to have the business process be predictable, because regardless of who entered that person into the system, the new client, for instance, um, you can then rely that it has been done in a certain way. That, that's the reason for that particular business process. Um, so it makes sense to have those things. But in some cases, it is just the way it was done. It doesn't, make, it doesn't necessarily make sense in any particular way. It could easily be done, have been done differently. But you can't just change it. Because then other things rely on it. Somewhere along the way, someone else gets notified or gets extra input from somewhere. And so it all interacts. And it becomes this, um, uh, let's call it a mammoth tanker. You can't just turn it. Um, it takes a long way. And I often see businesses deciding essentially in an executive meeting around the table that they're going to do something different. An executive decision has been made that the business is now going to be run differently. They're suddenly going to be customer focused. I can't believe it. I mean, come on, that's not going to work. Um, you can't decide to suddenly run a different kind of business because your entire business is tuned to whatever it has been doing in the past. If your customer service has sucked in the past, you're very good at sucking. Um, that's, that's what the business process has been tuned to. So if you realize that, you might be able to do something with it. But sitting around the table with the managers and deciding that you're suddenly going to do it different is laughable, really. Um, and I don't think I'm the world's greatest expert on this kind of stuff, but I'm really amazed how businesses still try to do this kind of stuff and pretend that it kind of works. Because then you can then you can then observe and see that it doesn't work. So why don't they learn? I don't, I don't know. Um, 
things that I've noticed in particular, effects of funding and operational cost, and you've, you've noticed in the, um, in the upstarter principles, um, open query and, and other related businesses do not borrow or lend money. Um, so I don't play a creditor to my clients, but that's a, that's a little sideline. We can talk about that another time. Um, we didn't start with any external capital. I tossed in about $1,000 of my own just to get, get going. You know, the usual, the usual pocket money to register the business, the website, and, and get business cards printed, get a, get a VoIP phone line, and that kind of stuff. Um, we don't have bank credit. Okay? Now, you may think that may not matter that much. Doesn't that impede my growth? Well, it might but it also maintains my sanity. I don't have the extra stress of potentially having to pay someone back later on, and I don't know if I'll have the money at that point. And it also doesn't put a strain on my, um, my revenue and, and my profitability, because whatever I borrow, I'll need to pay back with interest, right? Well, whatever I make in money now, I actually own all of it, which means I make more profit by definition. And that's a much nicer way of doing business, at least from my perspective. So it, it, it releases me from some of those worries. Um, but it also means, and I think that's more important from a business process perspective, it means that I have to run my business in a different way. I don't have a pile of cash sitting next to me, enabling me to do whatever I want within the confines of that pile of cash. Yeah? So I want to do some marketing. Oh, yeah, I've got some cash. I'll toss it at that, and I'll start that new initiative. I can't do that. Whenever I have an idea, I need to work out whether it's actually affordable. And preferably, most things are affordable once you figure out how to do it without any money. Or maybe a little bit of money. And that's, that's what I mean with working, that's, that's the rule number two, work on the basis of a zero budget. Doesn't mean I have no money. I've got money, quite a lot of it, and it's quite nice to have it there. But I don't want to be spending it all, is the point. Um, it's, it's there to be used when necessary. So I try to work out whatever I do, whatever new thing I do, to try and work out how to do it in the cheapest possible way. And in many cases, it turns out that you can do things for free, or only for a couple of hundred, hundred dollars, rather than spending thousands on it. And it turns out that spending a lot of money on something usually is very much not effective. For instance, Open Query early on did um, AdWords, and it got us some extra leads, but it didn't actually convert into any clients. Where we get our clients from is word of mouth, as well as people just Googling, coming to us, thinking, oh yeah, we'll talk to them and, and having a chat with us. Whether that is up, whether that is because of the way the website is, is built, I don't know. The website is not that good. I'll happily admit that. I haven't done a lot of research into that. But word of mouth and just general, um, generally coming. Um, so that's how we get our clients. Now, there's a rule that says don't stop doing AdWords because people will notice you've stopped advertising and think there's something wrong with the company. They want that visibility. I haven't noticed that in my case. I'm not saying the rule is incorrect. I just haven't noticed it. We stopped it. And it saved me a couple of hundred dollars a month. Perfect. And I didn't actually lose anything because of it. So I can now use that money for something else or just have extra profit, whichever way. Um, so that's effects of funding. Now, if you get venture capital, any idea what, what the consequences are for the way you do business? Any thoughts? <laughs> but Dale has a good giggle. <laughs> Yo. You do, you do get a bunch of other business brands and contacts that enable you to grow business. Okay, so you get additional contacts and advice and, and so on. But could you get that without the VC? Uh, yeah, you can stop that person may still be enticed in spending their time on you rather than just their money. I don't know, but. I'm quite happy to help, help other people, and I'm hopeful that people with lots more money than me are also that willing. And the ones that I know are very willing to interact. They don't necessarily need to have a stake in the company in a financial way. It's not all about the money. It's not all about the money, definitely not. But the thing is, because there is money involved, there are consequences. Um, they put in a certain amount of money, and they want that back 10 or 20 times over, because that's the way it, it, it works in VC land. That means you need a ridiculous growth trajectory that is not natural to a company. So you use that money to grow faster. And what's the end point? You need, it, there's an exit strategy. The only way to pay back 10 or 20 times is to either sell the company or float it on the stock market. So that's where you're heading. That's fine. 
and you can make potentially a lot of lot of money in the process. But I think it leaves skeletons along the way. A lot of stressful, a lot of people get stressed along the way. Um, I'm not sure it necessarily helps the clients in the best possible way. Um, and once it gets bought or floated, will it continue to serve the clients in a in a good way? Because often companies that get bought die. They get gobbled up. They get put aside and and and, and die off. Um, and that's been quite interesting. And you can look at that even in the MySQL sphere. It's doing all right inside Oracle now. But MySQL was about ready to float on NASDAQ. We're actually making preparations. That might not be publicly known, but I can tell you that one. And at that point, there was a negotiation with, with some microsystems. Some microsystems bought, bought it. Now, that was still OK. But the way of operation internally was not quite as ni nicely compatible as it could have been. And it didn't improve in terms of development and quality for the users. It didn't actually create improvements that you would like. And then all of some microsystems were bought by, by Oracle. And naturally, putting one database inside another database, well, not a database company anymore, but they have their own database, um, puts it in a completely different position to where it was. And companies can't disrupt themselves. So as far as MySQL was a disruptor to Oracle, it by definition can no longer be at least that part that they own now, as in the trademark and so on. The ecosystem is alive and well. That works perfectly well because that's been building for 15 years. But it can no longer be disrupted the way it was because Oracle can't dis disrupt itself internally. If a salesperson, and we'll get to that, the salesperson on commission, if they go out somewhere, are they going to sell a service contract to MySQL or are they going to sell the service contract to Oracle? They would much rather do the Oracle thing. It's more expensive. It, it gets them more money. That looks better on the bottom line for them. They work on commission, most likely. What are the consequences of that? If you have a salesperson who works on commission, you will be, let's say your commission is 100,000, uh, or your, your quota is $100,000. You will be going for the $10,000 $10, customers. You can't talk at all to the $1,000 customers. You may want to, you may say you are, and many salespeople or companies that you ask will say, yeah, we do take care of the little ones. You don't. They drop off the edge of the table. No malicious intent, but please acknowledge it. You can't talk to those people because you don't have the time. You'd have to set up separate salespeople who don't get paid on commission to talk with those fellows. Or um, have an online sales system that doesn't require the human interaction. Online sales in a web, web shopping cart can be a very good solution for that. And that can be done. MySQL stuffed that up for about five, six years before they actually had an offering um, for about 100, between $100 and $500 online available. For that entire time, they couldn't get it done, which is quite amazing for a company that actually builds databases for web use. It's quite impressive. Um, so inside my organization, I'll never have a salesperson on commission because it, it would sell the wrong thing to the wrong client. I'm not trying to go up market with my company. If I go up market with my company, I will get slaughtered by the competition because that's where the competition lives. I currently live below the competition. I'm so cheap that they can't compete with me. And if I'd up my prices this way, I'd go for the larger contracts, I'd get competition. I don't need them. I get enough customers and the market is actually really, really big. I don't need to capture everybody. So that's that salesperson. Um, bending over backwards for clients. So we do... Um, we do database maintenance. We also do system administration. That is really close. And I had a long, hard look at that, whether we actually should be doing that. And I think we should. That's just my thought there. Should we also be helping people build their web apps? No. Most of us are, at least on the sideline, web developers or have done that in the past, that kind of thing. We really don't involve ourselves in web application development, even though we could theoretically do that. So when a client asks, the simple answer is no. And there's no amount of money you can give us to make us change on that. The same happens for that, that emergency services. There's no amount of money you can give me that will make me do emergency work. It is not a matter of money. It is a matter of, I want my company to run well the way that it does. And trying to do those other things will not make it a better company. And it will not actually serve that client in the best possible way. It will stuff it up for everybody, including me, my, work, my co-workers, the other clients, and probably for that one client as well. It's not going to provide the best service because that's not, that's not what we're tuned for. Um, we also never apply for government tenders. We do do gigs for government training. We've 
done training for Department of Defense, uh, Parliament House, New South Wales Department of Revenue, all over the place. Uh, Queensland uh, or Brisbane City Council, um, but we don't apply for government tenders. That's a lot of work. We don't have the administrative or executive staff to do that. Um, it's a lot of work, and then potentially you get a big gig out of it, but maybe you don't. It's a lot of effort, so we don't bother. The fact that it is 70%, apparently 70% of Queensland IT, the budget is indirectly or directly government related. And so I've been told, you must, you must go for this because it's so large. No, sorry, um, that 30% is already large enough compared to the size of my company. I can grow a heck of a lot more without getting anywhere close to that 70%. Don't care. Um, so that's another thing I just don't, don't bother with. So that growth imperative, um, imperative mentioned, mentioned earlier, um, must companies grow? Or must they grow a certain, certain amount to be, to be viable? I don't think they do. Um, maybe at the moment you have to grow at the rate of inflation, just to make sure you have your, eh, you have your revenue you covered. That's one of those numbers you do have to deal with in the real world. You do have your bread and, and milk to pay. Um, but does it have to grow by 10 or 20% every year to, to make you happy? I, I heard from Paul Gamp that um, Red Hat has been growing at 20%, and it is rather painful. Um, we, were, we were talking about a partnership earlier on, and we hadn't had the time to catch up because he was too busy hiring new people. That was literally what he said, and he's quite happy to <laughs> mention those things. That's good. That kind of openness is really useful. Um, but yeah, that, that, that doesn't really make much sense growing just because you think it is necessary for a company to grow. It is also not the case that, um, or I think it's not the case, that if a company doesn't grow, or you necessarily have to pass it on to hey, your son and daughter or, or whatever. I don't think my daughter is going to be doing MySQL remote database maintenance, really. I don't think I will be doing remote database maintenance in, in 10 years necessarily. So this company may just end, finish. Is that a problem? Is that destruction of wealth? I don't think it is. It's been a really great experience. It's paid all the bills for me and a number of other people, more than a handful at the moment. Um, it's paid all the bills. It works perfectly fine. So the fact that it ends and doesn't get sold is not a destruction of wealth. It served its purpose. I have other things going, and they will, they will, um, they will make money at that point. It's like a new product. Yes, quick question. Well, I agree with everything you're saying, but there's one group who will be horrified by that. That's lovely, but if they were to sign up with an enterprise deal with MySQL, the company, they've now been bought by Sun, they've now been bought by Oracle, the prices have, have risen and the service has dropped on, on average, and at some point the service may disappear. So what have they bought there? And that was a big VC-funded company, so what you get? So I agree with your question in, in principle. But in reality, I'm no less reliable than the next guy, even though I'm small. And yes, in some cases, they may exist in 10 years with that particular database and still have needs. It may be that they're, they are big enough to, to serve those needs internally. There will also be other businesses and individuals who will be able to help them. I'm not the only one who can serve them in the market. The market will change over that period of time and may be able to tune itself more and not care. Yes? The, uh, it's actually, I'd be worried. I do worry about the opposite problem. Are the customers will have, will what fraction won't have moved on to something else in ten years? Whether a, an elaboration of the current product that they're mm -hmm. using or something else entirely. Okay, so I, you, you're okay. So you're saying I might I might lose customers because the customer moves on, even though I'm still doing the same thing before I leave my current company. Or yes. Now, the way uh, Open Query is designed is to not float up markets. So we don't add a lot of features, which means that we might actually grow, kind of grow our feature set at the same rate that our customers do, rather than overshooting them, as most companies do. That's a, that's a generic plot. Um, if, you're, if you're a disruptive company, you tend to offer less, and then at some point you cross. You add features and features in terms of service or product. Um, and then at some point you offer more than the client requires, and then you start looking for a different market. That's why you float up market. We don't do that, and we specifically aim to not do that because we, we like the level that we're on. We do lose some customers sometimes because they grow too big. They create business processes because just of the way they, they, they develop their company that are no longer compatible with ours. They need different requirements. Sometimes they start creating emergencies just because of the way they work. That's fine. There's other businesses that we work with that offer 
those things. One is the Pythian group that also do remote maintenance. They do offer emergency services. They're actually not that much more expensive than we are, and they do offer that. We give them a personal introduction with the CEO, not a problem, we pass them on. We actually have happy non-customers and ex-customers. That works just fine. We will serve those who we can, and we'll try to pass those on that we can't. And I'm not scared of losing a customer. The ones that are happy with the way we work and are right for what we do and vice versa, they stay with us. Um, just a sec. Um, I've, the, the China thing. Um, if you're producing a product, there's that... You must have economy of scale because hey, if, you, if you sell more, that, that would be really, really great. You can run things cheaper. Um, what did we come up with on, on Wednesday? Was it the China, the China threshold? That was it. So the way I figure it, if you make less than 10, let's arbitrarily, if you make less than 10,000 of something, China is not going to be interested in you because there's no way they can compete with you. Does that make sense? It's not going to be economically viable. If you stick your head above that, and it might be 100,000 or whatever it is for the particular product that you're looking at, then you've not only got China, but others that do work in that economy of scale. You've got those people competing with you. So being small can actually be a benefit. So it depends a bit on what kind of work you're doing and what kind of service or product you're providing, but not sticking your head above that level can be really beneficial. There's always others elsewhere in the world who can deliver products and services cheaper as soon as you stick your head above that. And um, I would theoretically be competing against Oracle. I'm not, really. I provide a service. I couldn't compete if I was in their space. So that kind of gives you an idea how I operate there. I'll skip past these things. Um, I mentioned the, um, the products overshooting the market. So offering something that is good enough, for instance, by removing something, like I mentioned, I don't do emergencies, that's something removing. That usually improves a product. It gives other opportunities, and it is something your competitors or would-be competitors can't, can't offer. Um, my clients generally have not um, acquired a similar service before, so I'm selling to non-consumers. I'm not competing against other people in that marketplace. That's really important. There's always lots and lots of non-consumers that just haven't been served before, and because my product is simple enough, my service... I can actually talk with them, and it's simple and cheap enough. It works for them. Here's an example how that worked for Nintendo. Um, if it's high up, things have been improved over normal. If it's somewhere in the middle, it's like the way it's the regular, you know, CPU power, price, GPU power, and that kind of stuff. Um, so this is how Nintendo disrupted the market. And this is called the value curve. And we play that, that game a bit inside Upstarter for, for businesses. We've done it for political parties to, parties to see if they actually differentiate around the election time earlier this year, or early last year, and so on. And um, you see, Nintendo is clearly disruptive. It really doesn't care about some things, like high-definition video. It doesn't have a VGA output. It doesn't have it. You can't create it. Maybe someone has hacked it to get it, but I can't get it on my Wii. Um, so... You have a video out, and of course that doesn't create the most fantastic um, video experience compared to, for instance, the Xbox. Yeah, that has fantastic graphics. We does not have that. And it doesn't offer a lot of storage. It has its little onboard thing you can stick in SD cards. That's it, or USB key, I think. Um, but what does it do? It has lots and lots of games. It has its fantastic ecosystem, and it has like, you, what they call unique gameplay. The graphics aren't fantastic. You've got those little me, me characters. They're kind of cute, but a bit weird. Um, but the games are just fun. There's not that many buttons on the, on the consoles, but they just, they just work, and lots of people and kids have, have a lot of fun with it. I've never owned another game console in my life, but I bought a Wii because I just like the way that works. So again, I'm a non-consumer. I will serve by that particular thing. And that's the kind of thing I'm generally looking for with new business ideas. Can you plot it out in its feature set as disruptive in the market? Um, the one I couldn't find quickly, but you can think it out for yourself, Amazon. It completely disrupted the book market because on pretty much everything, they're the opposite of what a regular bookstore would do. A um, little bit of time left? Okay. Um, so traditional businesses, they aim for revenue and growth, um, but that's just because... That's apparently the way it's done. And I'd like to ask the question, why? Um, and managers make decisions based on the business aims, whatever they may be. But if they don't get questioned, why is the business aim the way it is? Is there a specific purpose that you can actually validate along uh, with all those steps? Maybe you could think about doing that differently. 
Um, but you, you can't suddenly decide to do things differently. The business processes will sabotage that. Um, and there's a nice example of this. A a a a well, there's companies that really can't disrupt themselves. For instance, Seagate, long, long ago, you had the five and a quarter inch disks, and they produced three and a half, I hope I get the brand names right, they produced a three and a half inch disk. It was more expensive per megabyte, of course, no gigabytes at the time. It was more expensive per megabyte, but it was much more reliable, and of course, it had the lower form factor. So they went to one of their clients, a little company named IBM, you might have heard of them, and they came up, this is a better disk, and IBM looked at that thing, and they looked at the IBM PC, and it had those nice four, five and a quarter inch slots, and I thought, you know, bugger off. Doesn't, <laughs> we don't need that. Whatever we have is perfectly fine, not a problem. However, a little company that was trying to build laptops named Toshiba was really, really interested because it enabled them to, it is enabling technology, that's the term for it. It enabled them to build laptops that were portable, even though it was more expensive per megabyte, it wasn't possible to build a laptop without such a thing, so it didn't matter that it was a bit more costly. Similarly, later on, um, the compact flash cards came along. They weren't plugged into our computers at the time, were they? They ended up powering um, the cameras and all those things. It was enabling technology for that different set of technology. So whenever you're trying to plug something into your existing clients, something really, really new, it's not going to work that way. It's going to be something different. IBM PC was developed by a separate business unit inside IBM in a separate state with its own budget and its own management because otherwise it would have been murdered by its own mainframe business. Just the internal management decisions would follow the money. The money at that point came from the, um, the mainframes. So you're not going to spend money on that PC thing that may or may not work. You're not going to kill off your own business that is known to work. The trick is, of course, that now IBM, they still have mainframes, interestingly, but way less and most of the business, it's moved on to services and so on, but they had that big PC business for a long time. So if they'd followed the money at the time and not disrupted themselves by spinning it off, they would have maybe killed themselves over time because what works now, what works next year, next year, doesn't work in five years. That business would have been dead. Someone else would have come along and done it for them. So they did disrupt themselves, but not internally. And that's the trick. Um, so you do a spin off. Um, there are some cases where you can tweak your internal business rules, but that depends a bit on how you run your company already. I, apparently, there are a couple of examples of this, but they're very, very rare. I haven't found a good one yet. The ones that I've seen successful are the, are the ones that, that spin off and just start something elsewhere, make sure they can't interfere with each other. Um, cool books I've based my ideas on are there, and I'll be happy to pass you um, their, their titles. Um, can I impose for 10 minutes, or is, is that really over time for the video? Sh shall I run it in the tea break, maybe? Yeah. If people want to see. Okay, I'll, I'll leave it on here then. Um, so this is really cool, um, I think it's cool, video about what motivates people and how that relates to, for instance, your, your, your salary and that kind of stuff. And it's probably nice to see, but it takes 10 minutes, so I'm out of time. I'll take one question, maybe? One question, a couple of questions, and um, and then I'll, I'm I'm here all week, so feel free to ask. Um, you, you talked about that you, there's some things you don't want to do, for instance, emergency support because of your lifestyle choices. But um, a, a harder question is how do you decide to say do sys administration and not web app development? Like where do you draw? How do you know where to draw the line? Um, so the question is how how do I draw the line in, in in what what to do and what not to do? I don't know. I don't have magic juice for it. Um, Open Query doesn't contain magic juice because anything we do and decide, we talk about publicly like here, so good that you asked the question. I really don't know. I make it up. Choose what you like. I choose what I like, what seems sensible at the time, and sometimes I'm dreadfully wrong. Um, the good thing is that I usually don't spend enough money on being dreadfully wrong to, to hurt the business in a significant way. We made choices early on in terms of the tools we used, and one of them was a wiki that really turned out to suck for what we do. And, I don't know, we're probably in actual work being done, mostly by internal people, but also contracting, spent probably about $20,000 on the wrong thing. Bummer. Um, but in the meantime, the company still survived, and that's, that's all fine. So I don't know whether this administer the right choice and the web administer would have been the wrong choice, but lots of companies do web development. Um, we'd have to do a heck of a lot of work to actually make people happy, whereas sysadmin 
is really, really close to what we do with database administration. In many cases, we also have to tune the operating system anyway. We have to do upgrades. So we need, we need that access on the environment anyway, and to co together with the monitoring as well. So it kind of blends in more naturally. So it's more, I think it's closer to our core business. Now, whether that's a valid reasoning, I don't know, ask me next year and I'll tell you, because it, these things develop over time, and what was the right answer this time may stuff things up later. I could be wrong. Um, what would you do if you had to, um, so suddenly your business needed a big investment up front, that, uh, a big, say, say the cost of the cool new MySQL debugger was $100,000 for your company license or something like that, or $200,000, and you needed that to really keep going. And you obviously didn't have two hundred thousand dollars sitting around. I mean, that's your business One principle. Bit. You can't do it, but you sort of, yeah. I might have it around, but I'm not going to spend it on that. It seems like a really, really bad investment. Yeah. Um, I think that the technologies that we that we operate with doesn't don't require us to make that kind of investment. Um, we're not a MySQL Sun Oracle partner. Never have been, because what they deliver is not something in terms of the partnership um, benefits is not something that we benefit from. You get name exposure on the website, that's great, but people can already find me and it doesn't seem to be a hindrance. I know partners who have been on there and they didn't get a heck of a lot of benefit from their perspective either. So as long as you're well enough known in the ecosystem, that works out fine. Needing specific tools, I, I think that's not the case for the kind of business that I'm in. I would try to find markets for any, just making it generic for any service or product where you don't need that kind of thing because that makes the upfront cost higher. You need a larger budget to do that. I don't like that kind of thing. Um, I do have an example that might be somewhat related. For instance, um, um, starting a restaurant. So lots of people want to start a restaurant. There's lots of them around. Did you know that most of them don't live longer than two years? Which by coincidence is also the, um, the average lifespan of a new startup company. Many of them, or most of them, don't live more than two years because that's about the time you need to fail. Um, it's a nice time, but you can often save yourself the time. I'm always amazed that people go to the bank with a business model on, on, on the restaurant. They have this really good idea. They have some experience. They get $50,000 or $100,000, spend that on the restaurant, and then they fail two years later. I think that's a really weird, weird idea because after that, you have a debt to the bank of that amount, you need to work even harder to pay that back before you can start something new. How about they save up that money first doing something else, then they have $50,000 of pocket money, start a restaurant, fail or not, but at least they will run, they can walk away afterwards if they were to fail, and it's an interesting experience. I like to build things with my own money, and if I need that $100,000, I would want to run a business first, either a different business or the same one, that makes that amount of money, that also gains me the experience to handle that kind of money, and then I can start something new within the same company or new one that, well, that requires that kind of business. So definitely there will be businesses that require a larger investment, but I want to have the experience internally to actually be able to cope with that. And then if it fails, I can still walk away without being in debt behind me. I'd like to have, you know, I'd like to, if I see that I need to spend money, I'd like to make it first. Because for the person who's, who has had the failed restaurant, if they can work afterwards and make that money back, why didn't they do that beforehand? It's, not the, it's the same situation, right? They do another job and they save up money. Well, they could have done that first. And it doesn't take that much effort, particularly for the 50K. It's not that big a problem. Things are manageable. And actually, if they have to pay back the bank, they have to pay back more money. So it's cheaper to do it beforehand. Last question, maybe? Or do we have more time, Michael? OK, yeah. So this is a lot like what I've heard uh, called a, a lifestyle startup. Are, are you familiar Possibly. with the term? No, but I'm now. Yeah. Sounds, sounds about right. Yeah. yeah. OK. Um, I think the implication in a lifestyle startup is that people who are involved are happy not to make any money for a while. Sorry, I, I was just going to say, I think the implication in the term lifestyle startup is also the notion that there may be a couple of you know partners involved who don't actually expect to pay their mortgage with it for some period of time. Okay, great. Um, yes. Okay. Just, sure. just to be clear, Open Query has paid its way and my and my rent and and everything um, since since day one. It has paid the bills. There has been no dip in in that perspective. So it's and that's definitely important. And I agree with the other um, commenter there. 
if it is about lifestyle, then the ability to pay rent is really, really important because otherwise that affects my lifestyle considerably. <laughs> It is the difference between a job and a hobby. This is definitely a job, um, but I like doing, I, I like this, but I do mention to people, being handy with databases is what I do, it's not who I am. I like cooking, and that's why on Friday you're welcome at my house to do that, that uh, Geek My Dinner, it's on, the, uh, it's on the, the wiki. That's another thing I do, and I, that's really a hobby. I'm not going to start a restaurant next week, that's not what I do. Um, so there's a difference there, but yeah, the company should definitely make money, it should definitely grow, but I'm not going to hire new people um, to hopefully make more money. The way that I work, and feel free to ask me in the corridor later, it allows me to grow slowly and, and actually hire people when I need to. Um, so I don't necessarily grow slower than I would otherwise, but I'm not going to hire people in the hope that I can get bigger clients, because those bigger clients, bigger than what I currently have, would cause trouble. I need more of the same in the same realm that works best for me. Okay? okay? Yeah. Thanks very much. Okay.